Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video we got a, uh, uh, well, a weird one. This is the story of Dr. Martin McNeil and his wife Michelle McNeil, and what happened after he encouraged her to have some cosmetic surgery. Old Marty McNeil was a very successful doctor and had a law degree to boot. Michelle, a beauty queen and they had eight children together over almost three decades. However, for old Marty, I guess that just wasn't enough. You know, beauty queen wife, really rich, doctor, having a law degree, eight kids, living the dream. Easy to imagine, that's never enough, am I right? Cause it's a, a big ol' whoops, wink. This case has it all, and it's set in Utah because they're mad for madness over there. Come on, let's get into it. Martin McNeil had been married to Michelle McNeil for 29 long years. You know, it's a pretty long time. It's a long marriage. And you would think by, you know, almost three decades, they would know, you know, the ins and outs of each other by then. But it turns out that Martin McNeil is quite a tricky person to know. Yeah. And Michelle stopped knowing Martin on the morning of the 11th of April, 2007. A call was made from Pleasant Grove, Utah, where the mother of eight children, Michelle McNeil, was found unconscious in the bathtub. The caller was Dr. Martin McNeil. Michelle had been found by her six-year-old adopted daughter, Ada. Now, it's kind of hard to make out what Martin is saying, and in fact, Martin hung up three times during their conversation, until the dispatcher could finally figure out where to send the ambulance. At one point, Martin sent his young daughter Ada off to the neighbours to get somebody to help him lift Michelle out of the bathtub, as he couldn't do it uh, himself. Then, when she was out, Martin started doing CPR, you know, ah, oh, stay with me, stay with me. He would alternate between, you know, blowing into her mouth, and shaking his fist at the sky, you know. Not her, why? When the EMTs arrived, he was losing it. Shouting at his wife, the EMTs, even God. He was putting on quite the show, eventually having to be removed from the scene, he was slowing down the paramedics so much. And when the EMTs started doing CPR, that's when water started coming out of her mouth. Martin McNeil had already been doing that, and he was a doctor, and water wasn't coming out. You'd think he'd know how to do it by now. Michelle McNeil was rushed to hospital, where she was pronounced dead. The next day, an autopsy was done. It was found she had an enlarged heart, as she had high blood pressure for years, and some medications mixed with heart conditions cause arrhythmia, which can be fatal. And, funnily enough, Michelle was prescribed a few different medications following her surgery. She had a facelift just a few days before. And so, the pathologist came to the conclusion after receiving the toxicology report that the most likely cause of death was arrhythmia. Natural causes. Case closed. End of story. Tragic, but it happens, even though she was only 50 years old. Or does it just happen? Let's go back and begin at the beginning. Michelle Somers was born in 1957. She came from quite a religious background, her family being Mormons. They were a warm and loving family, she was close with her three sisters, and other than her dad not being around much due to his alcoholism, the family were happy enough. She was raised in Concord, California, did some modeling and won the title of Miss Concord. She was a looker. After graduating high school, she went to Brigham Young University in Utah. Where else? 
and at the age of 20 years old, she went to a party organised for the single Mormons in your area. And that was where she met handsome and charming Martin McNeil. His upbringing was not quite as happy as his wife's. He was a year older than Michelle, and he grew up in Camden, New Jersey, with five siblings. His family was dirt poor. His parents fought a lot, and even more when they were drunk. After his dad left the picture, his mom turned to prostitution to feed the family. They lived in a one-room apartment, so the children got quite the earful. In his late teens, Martin was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He tended to have quite frequent mood swings, some anger issues. He joined the army at age 17, and after less than two years was placed on disability leave. Throughout his time in the army, he would often mention to people that voices in his head were telling him to kill, so... It would be a good idea to not have him around guns. Now, Martin was a fantastic manipulator and constant, consistent liar, something he would do throughout his entire life. After leaving the army in 1977, he tried to forge a check in California, and he was obviously arrested and charged with forgery, theft, and fraud. Thing is, he only did it because he saw a bit about it on 60 Minutes and thought he could do better. It was in the middle of that case that him and Michelle met. One month after they met, they got married in secret because, because Michelle's family did not like him. He was controlling over her, manipulative, emotionally abusive. Martin ended up going to medical school in California and received a degree in osteopathic medicine. Years later, it was found out he had falsified his transcripts to get in, so that's great. He also had a law degree, but never practiced. Himself and Michelle would relocate a few times, California, Mexico, New York, and finally Utah, where he became medical director at the Utah State Development Center. Throughout the years, him and Michelle had four biological children in five years. Rachel, Vanessa, Alexis, and Damien. So while everything was fine and dandy, for a while. Uh, see, that's when threats came in from Martin. See, porn is, is uh, it's, uh, that's a bit, big no-no in uh, Mormonism. And one time when Michelle came in to see him popping a chub, she was like, listen, can't handle this now. Maybe we should talk separation. He did the old, uh, hey, if you leave me, I'm gonna kill myself. You'd feel pretty bad then, wouldn't you? That happened more than once. And another time, that exact same thing happened. Martin threatened to not only kill himself, but also kill his wife too. He had a knife in his hand, and one of his, his, his son, Damien, who was 15 years old at the time, had to jump in between them before something serious happened. So he's, so he's uh, got a few issues. We'll see that a lot more. So anytime Michelle talked about leaving him, he would do that sort of thing. Threaten to kill himself or kill her. While in the meantime, he was off having a shitload of affairs. As he was working in the USDC, which provided care for people with disabilities, most of them being mental disabilities, he took advantage of the disadvantaged and had sexual relations with some. What a guy. Now, the way Martin was shitty, that had an impact on their four children, which would become five when they adopted Ada. Most of the children had anxiety, depression. Vanessa, the second oldest, battled drugs for years. Ada, by the way, the adopted daughter, was actually Vanessa's who had her when she was a teen. By 2003, the kids were all grown up, with the exception of Ada, of course. And so, Martin and Michelle decided to adopt three children from Ukraine, of all places, ideally providing a better home for them than the impoverishment back home in Ukraine. They would have been better off staying. They adopted 12-year-old Giselle, 10-year-old Elle, and 13-year-old Noel. These girls faced difficulties due to language barriers, cultural differences, so much to the point they were actually bullied in school. Noel had problems also in general um, with her new caregivers, Martin and Michelle, something called reactive attachment disorder. So she was sent away to an institution in Michigan, by which point uh, Martin and Michelle decided to do the old switcheroo and, uh, you know, we still have the receipt. Noel was taken into the care of the state of Michigan, and soon after, they adopted another child from Ukraine, Sabrina.
In 2005, Martin's behavior changed. His daughters thought it was about to be a midlife crisis. If it was a midlife crisis, it was a hell of a midlife crisis. Should have bought a Ferrari. It seemed that the life he had built, which was a good one, was not good enough for him anymore. He started, you know, working out, pumping the guns, getting a tan on, and just banging every woman he could. One of his lovers, Anna, said he told her he had thoughts about killing since a young age, and that the thoughts sometimes became reality, including mercy killings while he was a doctor. Apparently, at the age of eight, while he was still living in New Jersey with his mother, he gathered all the drugs he could, mixed it with alcohol, and gave it to his mom, who was probably drunk on the couch. She started dying until his sister arrived home and called 911. Another time, his brother Rufus called Martin and said that he had done something stupid. Martin arrived, found Rufus in the bathtub, wrists cut open, water in the tub, at which point Martin, thinking this would look bad in the family, did the old, uh, pushed Rufus's head down until the bubbles stopped. By the way, you might think, you know, uh, one of his many lovers, Anna, who he was telling all this to, she might be, you know, disturbed by all this, maybe tell the police. Nope. Turns out she was into that shit. She had sent letters to the killer known as the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz. So, pretty crazy. But what... What happened, which will really hurt us towards the end, was when his new mistress, Gypsy Willis, entered the picture. Who Martin had met online. And his interest towards her turned into an obsession, with them getting really serious in 2007. Around this time, Michelle told her friends she thought her marriage was close to the end. She had multiple arguments with Martin, questioned him about the cheating. He never admitted it to her, though, even when the family found Gypsy's luggage in his trunk and phone records showing Martin constantly calling her. Martin, at this time, he also did the old, Oh, the foot, the hip, I need a cane to walk around, I'm afraid. He would walk around with a cane a lot. Um, he was grand. He didn't need one. Might come in handy, though, you know, for people to think you're a frail old man. If you, you know, had to try and get somebody out of a bathtub. Well, the time he had to get someone out of a bathtub came in 2007. One morning in March 2007, Martin told Michelle she needed a full facelift. He was really pushy about it. Come on, it'll help our marriage. Yeah, if you looked completely different and had a new face. Even when Michelle got checked by her doctor, saying that the surgery should be postponed until her existing high blood pressure got under control, Martin said, nope, she's getting it done and she's getting it done now. Michelle never had any plastic surgery before, but wanting to save her marriage, well, it's a long procedure, lasts for hours, and it's painful, as you can imagine getting your face cut up. After it was done, Michelle wanted to stay in hospital, at least overnight. Martin poo-pooed that idea, but their daughter Alexis, who was in medical school, agreed with Michelle, so she stayed in hospital with her for the night. Martin, in the meantime, got a lot of medication prescribed for Michelle. See, he was yapping away with the surgeon, you know, give me all this stuff. Doctor to doctor talk, you know? It, like, the surgeon would never prescribe what he's prescribing, prescribing, but he was like, you know, we're doctors. Drugs that were way unnecessary, especially as Michelle had a low tolerance with drugs. She was the kind who would never take the amount prescribed, always less. So, the next day, Michelle was taken back home. Alexis, who was on spring break from medical school, she began taking care of her mother, much to Martin's chagrin. At the end of the first day at home, that night, Martin came into the bedroom and told Alexis, go sleep uh, somewhere else, you know, I'll look after your mother. Then, the next morning, when Alexis went in to check on her mother, Michelle was way out of it, barely responsive. Alexis then went to speak to her dad, saying, What the hell did you give our ma? She's not good. To which Martin would say, ha, oh, Must have given her a bit too much. <laughs> Whoops, my bad. She'd be grand, you know, don't worry about it. Alexis thought that was maybe not good. So she began keeping you know, a little booklet of her mother's vitals, all the amount of medication she was taking, keeping track of everything. She was in medical school. And then when Michelle gets back to normal, kind of later on, she kind of recovers, she... T told her daughter that Martin kept feeding her medication, 
to the point where she puked, and he kept giving it to her. Michelle would even say to Alexis, This is how serious it was getting. If something happens to me, make sure it's not your dad. Alexis then kept looking after her mother until spring break was over, and she had to go back to college. And on the 11th of April 2007, Michelle, she was feeling a lot better. The young children, adopted ones, you know, they head off to school, Martin goes off to work. Uh, around mid-morning, Martin picks up Ada. She was still the youngest from school. They drive back home. Ada goes into the house first, starts looking for her mother, searches everywhere, until she goes into the bathtub. And that's that. The funeral was held four days later. During the service, Martin gave a speech. She was like, you know, our lad's here, you know, she's, she's out of here, so enough about that. Let's talk about me and how hard this guy's life is. So the grown children had all rushed home. Alexis had questions. Obviously, her mother was fine when she was there. As soon as she leaves, she's dead. They were looking around. Suddenly, the little booklet Alexis was keeping, tracking everything, was gone. All the medications were gone so they couldn't tell how many had been used. The bedroom emptied. In fact, more or less everything, boom, out of the house. So, not just Alexis had questions at this point. Another one of the daughters, Rachel, her gears were grinding too about what was going on shortly before Michelle's death and who was giving her medication. But the autopsy said arrhythmia, you know, natural causes, undetermined, but natural causes. Case closed, end of story, officially. The same day Michelle died, Martin was like, you know, we, uh, we need a nanny for the young ones to look after them. When Alexis offered to do it, she would, you know, leave college, quit her job, stay here to look after her, her sisters, you know? Martin, he wasn't having any of that. He was gonna get a, he was gonna get a nanny, and he knew a good one. He interviewed and hired Jillian. Now who's Jillian? I hear you asking. Gypsy. His, his, his mistress. When Alexis realized this, Martin kicked her out. A month after Michelle's death, he proposed to Gypsy. Didn't waste much time. Then, in July 2007, Giselle McNeil traveled back to Ukraine to meet her biological sister. She was gonna stay there just for a short while. This was Martin's idea. Martin, you know, he, he was hoping her stay, however, would be permanent. Because Martin, while Giselle was in Ukraine, he took her social security number and gave it to his mistress, Gypsy. Gypsy Giselle. Yeah, that'll work. Identity theft. See, he filled out an application, an ID application. Giselle, Giselle became Gypsy. Gypsy became Giselle. The reason for this was that Gypsy owed about fifty to $60,000 in back taxes. This identity theft scheme didn't work, although Giselle was trapped in the Ukraine for almost a year, and both Martin and Gypsy were arrested. Just in time, it turned out, because the pair were about to sell the McNeil family home and move. Essentially, to disappear, they had already found a family in California to adopt their adopted children. They were charged and found guilty of aggravated identity theft and fraud. Gypsy was sentenced to 21 months in federal prison. Martin got four years. So while they were in prison, the investigation continued, looking into Michelle's death, led by Alexis and Rachel. And the police finally started to listen now that they saw Martin for what he really was, a con artist. And that's when the police started getting calls about him being an inappropriate doctor, taking advantage of patients, which also explained why they moved around so much in their earlier years. But the problem was that Pleasant Grove police did not treat the house as a crime scene, collect evidence, or interview anyone but Martin. The medical examiner ruled the manner of Michelle's death was natural. It was just assumed to be a tragic accident. The investigators also wanted to confirm what prescription drugs were in Michelle's system the day she died. They asked the toxicologist to review the original toxicology report which showed an unusual combination of powerful sedatives and painkillers, including Percocet, Valium, Lortab, and Ambien. Things which should not be mixed, you know, not a good cocktail. During the investigation, the Utah County Attorney's Office 
also sent a letter to the law school in New York, where Damien McNeil, the son, was studying, advising them that Damien could be potentially dangerous to students, staff, and others, and also that he had been in the home when Michelle had died. Damien McNeil committed suicide in January 2010. So we don't really know the extent of Damien's involvement in what happened to Michelle. The Utah Medical Examiner's Office revised Michelle's manner of death from natural to undetermined, with suspicious circumstances. The net was closing in, and when in 2011 Gypsy was released from prison, she entered a plea deal, in which she agreed to plead guilty to all charges and to testify honestly in court if any murder charges were filed against Martin McNeil in the future. They didn't have to wait too long. Martin was released from prison in 2012, and a few weeks later, he was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. He went on trial in October 2013. He pled not guilty. On April 11th of 2007, the defendant picked up his daughter, Ada, from school. Ada was six years old and in kindergarten. And the two of them went back home to the McNeil family home in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Like many young children, Ada went to look for her mom. Michelle McNeil, who is also the defendant's wife. Ada found her mom unresponsive in the bathtub and ran to get the defendant. The defendant came in and saw Michelle in the tub. Ada ran to the neighbor's house to get help and the defendant called 911. This case starts a year and a half before April 11th of 2007 when the defendant met this person, Gypsy Willis. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what you've just heard from the prosecution reminds me of one of Aesop's fables that I first learned about when I was in high school. And that fable goes like this. A farmer who had gone into his field to mend a gap in one of his fences, found in his return the cradle in which he had left his only child asleep, turned upside down, the clothes all torn and bloody, and his dog lying near it, besmeared with blood, thinking that the animal had destroyed his child. He instantly dashed out his brains with the hatchet in his hand, and turning up the cradle, he found his child unhurt, and an enormous serpent lying dead on the floor, killed by that faithful dog, whose courage and fidelity in preserving the life of his son deserved another kind of reward. Now what are the morals of this story? Number one is that we shouldn't jump to conclusions, and the other is that we probably shouldn't let emotions cloud our judgment. And I'm not here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that Martin McNeil deserves a reward like the faithful dog in Aesop's fable. Martin has made poor choices in his life. You've heard that he's had affairs during his marriage. You've heard that he was having an affair with someone named Gypsy Willis at the time that he was married to Michelle. And that shortly after his wife passed away, he moved Gypsy Willis into the family home. And what are our reactions when we hear that, ladies and gentlemen? We may think he is a total jerk. That's absolutely disgusting. And that's natural. But it's very critical that during this trial, you set aside your emotion and you evaluate this case based upon the facts of the case rather than emotion. The prosecution, like the farmer in the fable, jumped to conclusions about Martin's guilt. But unlike the farmer who was willing to surrender his faulty perception in the facts, in the face of the facts of the case, the prosecution has continued to cling to its faulty belief, despite evidence in the case, including the medical evidence in this case, which shows that Michelle McNeil died of natural causes. The prosecution's perception is not supported by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Martin McNeil is innocent, ladies and gentlemen, and after you hear the evidence in this case, we will ask that you return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you for your time.
The three-week trial included testimony from McNeil's daughters. Will you please state your name for the record and spell your last name? Rachel Renee McNeil. Good morning. Good morning. Will you please give the court your name? Um, Sabrina Michelle McNeil. Will you please give us your name? Alexis Michelle Summers. Um, my mom was hesitant to get the surgery. Um, she was talking to my dad, um, saying that maybe we should delay the surgery um, until this. Well, yeah, a few things. Um, she wanted to maybe push it back until the summertime because I would be home for you know almost a three month period. And then she also had been recently diagnosed with some mild hypertension and wanted to make sure her blood pressure and things would be under control. And then also she wanted to lose some weight before having the surgery. And your dad was present? He was. You were listening to this? Yeah. Um, do you, did he have a reaction? Yeah, he had a very strong reaction. What, what was that reaction? He got really angry at my mom and said, no, you cannot do that. If you don't uh, have the surgery now, you're not getting it. Um, he was raising his voice and very animated and also said that um, he had already paid for the anesthesiologist and the operating suite. My father had a list of medications that he had prepared previously that he wanted uh, Dr. Thompson to prescribe. When you say he prepared, pre prepared that previously, how do you know that? Um, I had seen him writing them down um, a couple days before. I don't know if it was a couple days or the day before, but I had uh, seen him um, in his room writing medications down that he wanted the doctor to prescribe. And what did you do upon waking up? I went right into my mom's room. Okay. And what did you see? Um, I saw my mom and she appeared to be very sedated. Um, yeah, I went to my father and I said, what happened? Uh, obviously mom is over medicated. And did he respond? He said, yeah, and he did respond, yes. Um, he said, yeah, I think I gave her too much medicine. I asked her what happened, what is the what happened? What happened because she was very sedated and over medicated when I went in that morning. And she said, Lexi, I don't, I don't know why, but your dad kept giving me medication. He kept giving me things, telling me to swallow. And she said, I even started to throw up. But then he started giving me more medication and kept giving me medication. She was upset. She was upset. How could you tell she was upset? Because um, I knew my mom. Um, I could hear it in her voice. Um, she, said, she said that she didn't want my dad to give her any more medicine and that... Um, she actually had me take out every single pill from the pill bottles, and she wanted to feel what the pills fe felt like in her, in her fingers um, so that if my dad tried to give her anything, she'd know what he was giving her. You mentioned you went looking for the, uh, the medications. What did you find or not find? I didn't find the medications. Jailhouse informants. She was in way that she wanted the house and the kids. We talked, and he, he, I get, he just pretty much opened up about it. Okay. And he said that he uh, gave her some oxy, and he gave her some um, sleeping pills, some kind of sleeping pills, and then um, got her to get in the bathtub. Did he say what he did next? Um, later on, he just said he had to help her out. And I asked him what that was, and he said he held her head under the water for a little while. Medical examiners. Did you hear the defendant saying anything while you were there? Yeah, he was, uh, he was kind of yelling some things. Do you remember what? Um, cursing her for having the surgery. You know, why did you do this surgery? Um, I told her not to do it, um, things like that. I proceeded down the hallway to where they were initiating care on uh, Michelle. And what happened when you, when you went there? I had just a brief moment uh, interaction with the crew to see how things were going, but it was obvious um, within just a few seconds Mr. McNeil's behavior made it so that I was drawn away from the patient care uh, in an attempt to remove him from the, that exact location. What was he doing? He was just loud. He was telling us uh, to, he was, he was giving us orders as far as treatment care, treatment things that we needed to do for Michelle. 
former mistresses. He said about inducing a heart attack. What did he tell you? There's something you can give someone that's natural, that's there after they have a heart attack so that it's not detectable after they have a heart attack. Okay, so you can give someone some sort of substance that's yes. naturally occurring in the body mm -hmm. and it would be there after the heart attack, but it would also start a heart attack. Yes. And so you could cause someone to have a heart attack and the drug would supposed to be there anyway and so you wouldn't be able to tell. That's correct. On Gypsy Willis herself. I agreed to what he was saying. I mean... So the two of you had talked about what was going to happen before it took place? Briefly, yeah. And um, you had talked about part of this was to, to bring you into the home as the nanny. My recollection at this point is that it was to meet the family on better, you know, to, to have an introduction. Soon after this, you uh, attended a nanny interview, correct? Yes. Who conducted that interview? It was at the McNeil House. Um, I guess Martin conducted it. The, the children were there. I think everyone was there except Alexis. Perhaps. Who prosecutors alleged was the motive for the murder plot. A trial like this is about the truth. It's not about games. It's not about gotcha moments among the attorneys or the witnesses. It's about getting to the bottom of what happened to Michelle McNeil. And that is that she was murdered by her husband, Martin McNeil. It's about the truth and the administration of justice. The trial really made it clear, you know, how, um, how insane and crazy and weird he was acting in the morning his wife died after he had given her just a crazy cocktail of drugs and set up a nice bath for her. So first thing he did was send in his young daughter Ada to find her. So she would be the first, he'd be slow to get there. He had been pretending he had, you know, a cane. He was, he was very slow. He didn't need a cane, he just pretended he had one so that he'd be very slow to get to her. Couldn't lift her out himself because he was too weak. Had to call a neighbor to help him do it, therefore she was under the water for longer. Hung up three times during the 911 call, thereby slowing the shit out of an ambulance getting to the house. Performed CPR, so it looked like he was saving her when he wasn't doing it, because when the paramedics started doing CPR, that's when the water started coming out. And then when they were trying to take her out of the house, he was making a huge scene, thereby slowing them to get her to hospital. After 11 hours of deliberations, ending shortly after 1 a.m. on the 9th of November 2013, the jury convicted Martin of the murder of his wife, Michelle, and for obstruction of justice. We, the jury, having reviewed the evidence and the testimony in the case, find the defendant as to count one, murder, guilty. <laughs> as to count two, obstruction of justice, guilty. Take it this night, day of November. Thank you. Please be seated. After he was convicted, he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, 15 years for obstruction of justice, and Martin was also found guilty of forcible sexual abuse of Alexis also. He did this after his wife died and was sentenced to 15 years for that. His first appeal was scheduled for 2052 when he would be 96 years old. But Martin, <laughs> he, he couldn't wait that long. Couldn't wait that long. Wasn't having it. So, after two and a half years in prison, he killed himself. Officials with the Utah Department of Corrections say McNeil was discovered in one of the prison yards unresponsive. McNeil was recently denied an appeal to re retry his case just last month, and the six-year-old wasn't up for parole until 2052. Now, officials do not suspect foul play at this point, but Unified Police are heading the investigation to determine an official cause. Ashley he was found unresponsive in the outdoor yard near the greenhouse at the prison. He used a hose and a natural gas line that was intended for a heater inside the greenhouse to kill himself. What a way to end it all. Uh, thankfully, the younger daughters, they were adopted by Alexis. They have a home now. For Martin, he truly was a con man from start to finish, lying throughout every stage of his life and doing a whole lot of crazy shit. Because, you know, Martin, he always got what he wanted, you know, including getting out of prison. I mean, it was in a coffin, but still. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.